We welcome our guests opening the door inwards so that it doesn't bang on their face. It's tradition. However, it's not the case always. On 31st December 1929, 71 children died during the Glen Cinema disaster in Paisley, Scotland when a smoking cellulose nitrate film canister sparked panic. Children rushing out to escape the cinema became crushed against the padlocked exit doors. Even after a police officer broke the padlock, the inward opening doors were held shut by the mass of bodies behind them. Then it was made mandatory that the exit doors should always open outward and have crash bars. Even after the costly lessons, the similar stories continue to perpetuate in high-tech industries such as aerospace. Hi, I am Hilal Alam from Al Zebra. Today we are discussing about how simple conceptual errors in door design costed them dearly in aerospace industry. When John F. Kennedy, the then President of the United States, was ambitious about the moon landing, NASA carried out several trial tests with and without astronauts. The mission AS-204 was initially to be the first crewed mission of the United States Apollo, the moon landing program. It was planned to launch on February 21st, 1967, not to land on the moon, but as the first low Earth orbit test of the command and service modules under the Apollo mission. The plug doors were designed to open outward initially in the module. However, in another incident, the Liberty Bell 7 flight went as expected until just after splashdown when the hatch cover was designed to release explosively in the event of an emergency. It accidentally blew. The astronaut Grissom was at the risk of drowning but was recovered safely by a US Navy helicopter. The spacecraft sank into the Atlantic Ocean and was not recovered until 1999. The design team had originally suggested the hatch open outward and use explosive bolts to blow the hatch in case of emergency as had been done in Liberty Bell 7. NASA did not agree, arguing the hatch could accidentally open as it had on Grissom's Liberty 7 flight. The manned spacecraft center designers rejected the explosive bolts design in favor of a mechanically operated one for the Gemini and Apollo programs. However, the Apollo astronauts too had recommended changing the design to an outward opening hatch. NASA rejected the recommendation and went on to design the hatch open inward. At 1 p.m. on 27 January 1967, the astronauts entered the capsule on pad 27 to begin the test. It was a plus out test to determine whether the spacecraft would operate nominally on the simulated internal power while detached from all cables and umbilicals. Passing out this test was essential to make the February 21st launch. The test was considered non-hazardous because neither the launch vehicle nor the spacecraft was loaded with fuel or cryogenics and all pyrotechnic systems that is explosive bolts were disabled. At 6.31 p.m., a surge was recorded in the AC bus voltage readings, possibly indicating a short circuit. The cockpit recording is difficult to interpret in places, but a few seconds later, one of the astronauts, probably Shafi, was heard to say what sounded like flames. Two seconds after that, White was heard to say, we have got a fire in the cockpit. The fire spread throughout the cabin in a matter of seconds. Shafi said, we have got a bad fire, followed by shouting. The loss crew communication ended 17 seconds after the first indication of the start of the fire, followed by loss of all telemetry. The Apollo hatch could only open inward. It was held closed by a number of latches which had to be operated by ratchets. It was also held closely by the interior pressure which was higher than the outside atmospheric pressure and required venting of command module before the hatch could be opened. It took nearly 90 seconds to get the hatch open under ideal conditions. On the fateful day, because the cabin was filled with pure oxygen atmosphere at normal pressure for the test, the fire spread rapidly and the astronauts had no chance to get the hatch open. Nearby technicians tried to get the hatch but repeatedly driven back by the heat and smoke. 
by the time they succeeded in getting the hatch open roughly five minutes after the fire started the astronauts had already perished probably within the first 30 seconds due to smoke inhalation and burns the mission was officially assigned the name Apollo 1 in honor of the astronauts Grissom, White and Shafi. Later, several design changes including the outward opening door was incorporated in the following designs. On the 12th of June 1972, American Airlines Shortly after taken off from Detroit's airport, a cargo door at the back of the aircraft flew open. Only 67 people were on board, so the port collapsed only partially, thus the pilots had retained some of the control and landed back at Detroit safely. In 1974, a Turkish Airlines DC-10 had just landed in Paris after stopping on the journey from Istanbul to London. As personnel on the ground refueled the aircraft, they had loaded and unloaded some cargo. As the aircraft took off its second leg on the scheduled service to London, the very same thing happened. The cargo door burst open. The air pressure inside the cabin dropped. The fort collapsed. Subsequently, the pilots lost the control of the aircraft. Nearly 350 passengers were killed. Of late 60s and early 70s, Boeing did not compete with Airbus but with Douglas, which was later merged with McDonnell and subsequently renamed to McDonnell Douglas. Every single passenger jet is split into two, passengers at the upper section, cargo at the lower part. So the position of wires, cables and hydraulic lines run in different configuration in different designs. In Boeing, they run in the ceiling and in dc under the floor. So any damage to the floor, pilot's ability to control DC-10 is lost. In DC-10, the cargo area is pressurized. Again, this adds load. The air pressure is equal up and down. Thus, the floor doesn't collapse. The DC-10 has used a very similar system to car boot or trunk. When you open your car boot, you can see on the boot that there's a latch. When you close it, the latch attaches to a metal loop in the car frame thus making it impossible to open while the car is locked or when you drive. Anyways, Boeing went head-to-head -head competition with Douglas. To stay ahead in competition, Douglas wanted to save some cargo space and reduce part weights. In order to save weight, the cargo door locking mechanism was changed from the hydraulic actuator to an electrical one. This was new to Douglas as they operated hydraulic actuators on older DC-8s and DC-9s. To save cargo space, the door was modified to open outward so that the door swinging area could be utilized. These two modifications went horrible. When the electrical actuator was activated, a shaft pushed the latches that hooked onto the metal loop. The door would stay closed. As the mechanism reaches the center, the latches stay put because of the pressure and if it doesn't reach the center for some reason, the link yielded to the pressure and might open the door. As a result, the cargo area would lose pressure and the floor area would collapse and the pilots would lose the control of the plane as the aircraft control were in the floor between the two compartments. Finally, after the costly lessons, the door designs were changed its hydraulic system back. In these two cases, initial designs were working all right. It falls under the performance requirement in the Cano model. So far so good. Once the engineers attempted to address the demanded qualities or demanded requirements, they entered into unknown zones and all hell broke loose as usual. 
as with this i end this episode and let's meet again in the next video thank you very much bye bye